What's up, everybody? This is Sean Grant, and I'm your host this week on Inside Third and James. This week, uh, we sit down with legendary music producer Joshua Olson, and we get to know uh, all the ins and outs of Third and James, which if you don't know what Third and James is, it's a record label, it's a community, it's a recording studio, it's magic. It's magic. I love it's magic. it. I, I'm just it's going magic. off the top of my head. All right, so Josh, thanks for being here. My pleasure. How did I become legendary? Uh, I don't know. Why don't that you? That was one hell of a setup. Sean. Thank you. Thank you. For Thank that. you. Why don't you tell me how you are legendary? I feel like if we set them up with legendary, then everything's downhill from there. So we still, let's let's start with mediocre, and just maintain at mediocre, and then we can keep people excited. I say you're legendary. Okay. All right. I'll take it. Sean, by the way, folks, is uh, is uh, is a member of Denver Mega Band. Um, w- mega Band, I, dude. I, I'm sticking with Mega Band. You're legendary, and I'm in a Mega <laughs> that's Band. That's it. That's it. We've completely fooled these people. <laughs> so, um, what's your your backstory? Um, who are you, Josh? Started music in the church. Uh, my dad's a preacher, and yeah, not just a preacher. He started new churches, so. We, um, just by necessity, had to learn how to play an instrument because there was nobody to play music in the church. And so my sister and brother both learned how to play stuff. My sister is an incredible guitar player. My brother, trumpet. My mom's a piano player, guitar player. My dad's a um, little bit of a guitar player, got an incredible voice, so on and so forth. And so um, just kind of by default ended up playing the bass because... That was the extent of my talent level. Um, so, yeah, man, started playing in the church. And then my dad moved us up to Seattle in the early 90s and uh, from Oregon. And um, then was lucky enough to be a part of that awesome grunge, post-grunge scene um, as a spectator, you know, to start. And then little by little wormed my way into actually playing and in the in the late 90s and so on and so forth so yeah landed and landed uh landed here awesome man so you gotta you gotta be in the scene when uh nirvana uh and death cab for cutie and elliot smith all those bands i was in high school for nirvana i mean Cobain killed himself in what 94 i think it was 94 i graduated in 94 i think it was 96 we'll hook that up <laughs> google I'm just going to hedge my bets and say <laughs> 94. Um, yeah, no, I started playing music, like uh, like getting paid to do it when I was like 19, so that would have been like 94. And um, little by little kind of ended up in more established bands and then ended up in a band that was actually doing some things in the scene. So got to play all those legendary places up in Seattle and... And uh, yeah, I mean, it was a cool scene. It was one of those deals where it was like everybody, everybody kind of knew everybody and to some extent, and that you ran into each other at shows. And and then you had, you know, obviously uh, Nirvana had come and gone, gone. But uh, you know, you're right. Like Death Cab and and those guys all started popping up, and and all the guys from you know Allison Chains and Candlebox and things along those lines, they were still going strong. And so anyway, so how did you get into producing? Producing just happened on accident. Like, I don't know. I was just drawn to the guys that were in the studio. It's funny because you know you you can either grab onto the persona of the band and be out and and you know raising hell and having fun and and all that kind of shit, or you can be you know paying attention to the the parts of the the deal that are you know more technical and such. And and uh, because I was always somewhat of a mediocre musician, I guess I always knew that. Uh, at some point I was going to have to either diversify or die because I wasn't going to go on and be, you know, a Jaco Pastorius or a flea or something along those lines. Yeah. So anyway, that's how it started, man. And then little by little I'd be on a, I'd be on a project with some band and, and something would, you know, inevitably happen with the low budget producer that they'd hired. And I found myself, um, kind of falling into that role accidentally. 
And then once you've got a couple of records under your belts, then all of a sudden, you know, now people are asking you to produce records in addition to play on them, in addition to tour on them. And so it just kind of turned into a, a trifecta of playing, producing, and, and touring. That's awesome. Sounds like, sounds like that's the perfect way to go about it because not only do you get to be behind the scenes, but then you get, you get to do the live shows and, and get that glory as well. I hate the glory. That's part of the whole thing of wanting to hide behind a door in a studio, you know. I'm a shitty entertainer, and I've, I've said this to you before, but I, uh, I'd come off stage and try and find some dark corner to drink in. Like, I'm not, um, I'm not one of these people that, that um, either craves or enjoys affirmation of strangers, you know. And I think to be a successful musician, you have to have some of that in yeah. you. That's part of the, part of the draw of it. And not, not that that's a bad thing, it's just not me. And so, yeah, no, I didn't, I was never a great entertainer. In fact, I was mediocre at best. The thing is, I had a friend that said to me a few years ago, he used to say, it's incredible how far you've gotten on your lack of talent. And <laughs> I know it's cruel, but it's, it's pretty fucking true. What an honest friend. Yeah, right? <laughs> he's just a nice guy. Um, but he's right. You know, it's just one of those things where I think I was always meant to be in the studio. I was always meant to be on the other side of the glass in one way or another, and affecting the song. Um, but not necessarily taking that song out and playing it on the road. Plus, I'm one of those guys that, honestly, I'd rather be home with my family than on tour. Yeah. So We're sitting here in a world-class recording studio that I've never seen in Colorado. I've never seen anything like this um, done. I've seen a lot of studios, but none taken to this level. So uh, we're sitting in 3rd and James uh, studio, so why don't you tell us, let's talk about what 3rd and James is, but first let's talk about how 3rd and James got started. Yeah, 3rd and James was, um, well, the name kind of says it. I was uh, done a lot of things to in order to play music over the years. Um, and, you know, the one that, that gets talked about the most is that I, I bounty hunted and I did that for quite a few years, and that and raising horses. If um, hold on, sorry to interrupt. If you don't know Josh, if you've never seen him, Josh is like six five. When I, depending on my weight, he's like six five. Depending on the six, compression five, of my spinal cord, he's a he's an intimidating dude. So yeah. bounty hunting is like, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's like a perfect. Yeah, it was perfect it. for music. Yeah, it was perfect for music. I'm not sure it's perfect for me, um, but. That and I've always been I've always been a horse guy, um, at least in my adult life, um, and so that and and then a little time actually in the ministry, I majored in theology in college and uh, biblical languages, and um, so I did a little bit of that as well. But um, the first bail bondsman that hired me was at the intersection of Third and James in Seattle. Um, there was also a little bar down the road that I spent a lot of time in and got in trouble a few times in. And um, and then as I started having kids, my wife and I seemed to throw boys. And so I gave all my boys the middle name James. And so we've had three boys. We lost our second son, um, but we've got Wyatt, our oldest, Wyatt James. Our second that we lost is Cash James, and then our youngest, Deacon James. And, uh, and so it was just kind of a play on words of, of uh, you know, the three Jameses and then that intersection in Seattle of Third and James. But um, it started, honestly, as a production company, if you will. I think, in, I think at the time we were probably stretching it to call it a production company in that it was me at the beginning stages of, uh, um, you know, making music and I felt like I needed to incorporate or something along those lines. And yeah. um, at the time I didn't understand you know, business and actually incorporating and such. So it was just kind of like pick a name and tell people you're a business. Um, and then little by little, man, it just over the years, it kind of kind of stuck and stayed with us. And and, uh, and so when I retired from music, I thought in, I think it was 2011 or 2012, my wife and I moved to Kentucky um, on a contract uh, to with, with a horse uh, farm in just outside of Lexington and Versailles or Versailles or however you want to pronounce it. We re figured out pretty quick we were living in Kentucky and it wasn't, you know, one of those places that really kind of fit with what we were about. Um, and I had spent, you know, it was kind of, um, you know, my heart was in, in Nashville 
and Seattle. We, you know, have done a lot of work out of both of those cities over the years, and we were so close. It just kind of made sense to be dabbling back down there again. And so after our contract was up and they were offering us a full-time job, my my wife was, uh, you know, was was lonely being in Kentucky and, and suggested that I go back to just producing, you know, full-time because I wouldn't have to be on the road. And um, we were either going to move to Nashville or back to Seattle. And uh, my parents convinced us to consider Colorado. And so we did. And honestly, I thought it would be career suicide coming to Colorado to make music. Um, Was that? Just because it's uh, a killer music scene, but very little industry from from my perspective in that um, kind of an island. And I think the same thing that I've heard, you know, bands talk about and complain about quite a bit being being an island kind of in the middle of nowhere and um, a lot of really neat things have come out of here but from an industry perspective from a producing records perspective uh, you look at a lot of these big bands that Colorado's real proud of they they would go to LA or other parts of the country to not necessarily for their whole project but for large large parts of their projects and and um, and so I didn't look at Denver and say hey this is a music hub in America that I think I can go and build a name on you know yeah so initially it was kind of a half-hearted thing and we got here and um, started making some calls around town and and was not received um, well from the standpoint of uh, studios really wanting to you know extend a a hand and and work together so I actually ended up with a studio up on Colfax CCM Studios and Darren Scanson there um, he actually called me back and we ended up chatting and and he was willing to extend me the um, offer to be able to work kind of out of that room. And so I brought my console down from Seattle. I had this uh, vintage Trident 80B, which, by the way, is still in CCM uh, for anybody looking for a kick-ass console and a great team to work it. Um, and uh, I was just kind of going to do project stuff along those lines. But it kind of turned into one of those out-of-sight, out-of-mind things. Yeah. And so when, when I... Uh, when I started doing records again, the calls started coming in again, and then, um, unfortunately, we just were having to, you know, go to Seattle to do a record or go to Nashville to do a record or whatever, and found ourselves um, in a studio that just at the time wasn't large enough to kind of accommodate where we wanted to be, um, and that's where the conversation started about Third and James kind of re-upping as Third and James. So, that's when. The real third and James that I know it to be came about. Well, that's really when we crossed over from third and James music production to third and James records and third and James studios. And I've always had this idea and this passion for independent music. And I firmly believe that there's a resurgence of the independent label. And, um, and we didn't want to do some fly by night thing. So we, you know, took a lot of time to to talk about it, um, and kind of strategize, but yeah. So when we kind of separated, we, refired up third and james and so not only is third and james a recording studio but it's also now a record label yeah i mean actually really what we are is third and james is an independent label that has a recording studio okay so yeah like motown style yeah i mean i'm not exactly sure how they operate but from what i understand yeah they had a studio and a label and you know for us it was more based off of more of the sun studios muscle shoals kind of vibe where you know back in the day they they kind of discovered, developed, produced, and released records, artists, and their records. Um, and that's always kind of been my view of what would work again if ever given the chance to work again. And so when we started talking about Third and James and asking questions about how can we be fundamentally different, um, my head just kept going back to that. And so, yeah, we decided, number one, if we were going to be able to do something that was fundamentally different we were number one going to have to figure out how to do records uh, for artists that were at market quality but could be done for um, a price that they could actually afford yeah. and the only way to do that as a producer is to own your own space yeah um, it's just too cost too much money and so when you're paying not, the not only for for you but it costs money for the artist is that what you're saying yeah 100 so. percent. i mean for me it's one of those things where you find yourself when you're when you're working in another studio, you've always got the tension of uh, your producer's cut. So you're paying the studio back a cut, and then you're keeping a cut. Um, and oftentimes, what studios will do is they'll give you, um, you know, they'll give you their their break point where this is how much they have to make, and then you can charge whatever you want over the top of that. 
Uh, the problem is I'm just not enough of a name, especially in this area, to be able to charge over and above that enough where the margins are such that anybody can make money. And so even doing it on the cheap, when you're paying the studio cut, plus yourself and your engineer, or if I'm engineering the record or, or whatever, uh, you start you know flopping in studio musicians and, and all that kind of stuff and post-production and, and all that, which we have a tendency to kind of lump into our packages. Um, yeah, there's just no margin. Yeah. And there's no way. So what, what happens is producers become part-time. And when you have a part-time producer on a record with part-time musicians, you kind of get a part-time quality. Yeah. And so for us, the first step was we, we need our own room. If yeah. we do our own room, then we can we can figure out a way to make records for cheap because we own the room. Yeah. Um, so that was the first kind of the first step. Okay, so that was the first step. And obviously we're sitting in the room now and it's for everybody listening. It's if you know what Sound City is or Fairfax Studios, it's. It's about that size. It's got probably like what is it, like thirty foot ceilings. That'd be cool. Yeah. No, we're like we're 18? we we go from fifteen to eighteen foot okay. ceilings. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm it's a big room, it's... man. I think our live tracking room here that we're sitting in right now, the live tracking room itself, our main room is eighteen hundred square feet on its own. This is this is the biggest studio I've ever been in. I I mean that's not saying a lot, but I love that big room vibe and i love the ability to you know like david cobb's got you know rca studio a and you can kind of just set up in there and you watch those videos of those guys doing records in there and it's almost like they're like tent city you know they're just all set up in there and and they leave their shit and they just they make a record and um i've always loved that vibe and and been lucky enough to record in some of those awesome studios that are are big i'm not sure what the personality of this room is going to be yeah you know i think that time will tell with that but uh, we went big for a couple of reasons. Number one, yeah, to set ourselves apart. I mean, obviously, from a business perspective, that makes sense. Um, but I think what really what a big room like this does is it gives you options, you know. And yeah. so we have the capacity to um, get small if we want, and we have the capacity to get big if we want. Yeah. And so, and allows us to store this insane amount of organs that we have yeah. along the wall. There's like, there's like five organs sitting next to us right now. <laughs> Where else are you going to go? You know, you got to yeah. get your organs in the place. If, that if, and our you, guys, snare drum if collection. you guys need organs, Third and James is, is the place. Yeah, man. I love a good organ. That's um, for sure. What, what I really like about Third and James is that you, when I met you, you you told me the idea, and I wasn't sure if you were going to be able to, to do it because it sounded like you wanted to go big. But that's what I like about what Third and James is, is you're not – skimping on anything you're not doing a basement studio you're you're not doing a small studio you're not like working out of the box you're making a world-class studio and and that takes a lot of uh as apple would say courage to do that because the overhead of a studio is is a lot um especially nowadays when kids can go to guitar center and they think they can make a record in their basement Sure, and I'm sure they could if they sure, absolutely. if they really try. I mean, you can, um, but this is something that I feel like real records are going to get made here. Um, quality is going to come out of here, which that's what I'm really excited about. Uh, so why don't you? Well, on that, let me say something on that real quick. Yeah. I, let me let me let me let me say this because I don't want to. You know, world class is subjective, right? Yeah, and then world class comes down to obviously the room your console, your outboard gear, your microphones, um, and also the people that are making that all, all happen. And so from the standpoint of like perfection in our room, that's not us. You know, we're a big room and we've intentionally kept the warehouse vibe in here just cause I like that vibe, you know? So from the standpoint of perfection, you know, we, what we did was we took a space and said, how close can we get? Can we get close enough that we can do those quality records? But, you know, you go into world-class facilities. I mean, like, you know, you go into Ocean Way and, and Avatar and, and places like that around the country or even like Studio X or, or London Bridge in, in Seattle. Um, you know, these are studios that have, you know, angles in the corners of rooms that are, you know, just designed for one little frequency. That's yeah. not Third and James. Yeah. My thing is, is, I guess, and I know this might sound, you know, kind of, self-aggrandizing but 
I say I've made good records in a lot shittier rooms than this. Yeah. Does that make sense? Totally. So it's kind of like we this is the this is the best we could afford and we did our we did our best within the confines of what we had to get it as close to world class as we could while still having a personality and I yeah. think that's the part that that really for me anyway I've been fighting with the designer and and engineers and all that kind of stuff this whole way just to say um I don't want to lose the vibe. Yeah. You know. So anyway. Um you want a drink? All you got to do is find something that doesn't look like it's got spit in it. <laughs> There's whiskey and everything around. Um, so why don't you... Sorry for that. That was yeah, our... Yeah, yeah, no. We've got, we got I a think, guest here. I, I think it it's uh, a world class on the, on the scale that you can facilitate. I mean, this room is big enough to handle a small orchestra. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're, like when I, when I say world class, I mean like... It's, it's a large scale thing happening here. Um, yeah, large large scale. That's that's a good good word. Yeah, this room is gigantic. Uh, you've built it out. We're sitting next to a, an SSL console. Where did you come up with the money? Did you just have this money from producing records like your old bands? Like like how did that? How did the? So you had the idea and you had like the LLC. Of third and James, yeah. So where, where did you come up with the money? Family, was it like where did where did Just it come going from? Deep man, all Where's, right. Yeah, <laughs> let's get personal. Yeah, I think that's a big question that you know, like I have as somebody who wanted to to build a studio. It's like where, how did you make this happen? Did you make it happen? Did you meet investors? Mm-hmm. Like, what's the deal with that? No, is that too deep? No, not at all. all right. In fact, we've heard. We've heard varying versions of the, of some story um, multiple times coming back to us on this. No, um, I'm I'm not in any way, shape, or form wealthy. In fact, you know, my wife is a a dental hygienist. Um, I've been you know making music for a long time, but I'm not you know some level where I have back end points on Adele or something. You know, and yeah. you know getting all that kind of stuff. Nothing, nothing like that. Uh, really, how this started was it was I, I don't want to say dream because that sounds cliche. It was a, a kind of a a vision of something that I thought was possible that I started putting in the ear of people um, around me. And I have a tendency to um, be passionate about the things that I'm passionate about. And and when I'm passionate about it, I want to I process vocally. I really, really do. Like anybody that knows me knows that. Oh, I, I know. Um, okay, <laughs> <laughs> that I can I can tell a story or, or get on a subject and just you know the subject can be changed four or five times in a conversation and I'm still freaking you know completely focused on the one thing that I was talking about. Um, and so what happened was, man, I had I started a conversation with a bunch of people, and so I ended up um, ended up in a mentorship relationship with a partner in this business, but a. Um, I think more than anything, a coach and a friend. And um, is what is what's his background? Is he a music guy? Is he a bit like a business? No, he's a business coach? Man. Rod, Rod, uh, he uh, his accent is it's hard to kind of determine where he's from. To be honest with you, <laughs> it's like he uh, he started um, from what I understand started driving rescue boats in the North Sea off the oil platforms, but he was in the in the oil industry. And we we began this relationship of of kind of just talking about a vision of of this, and um, that started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so he was actually mentoring me through the process of looking for investors, um, you know, all over the country, guys that I've done business with and such. In fact, Third and James um, had investors that were willing to do Third and James as long as we did it in Seattle. Okay. Um, doing it in Denver was something that they couldn't be involved with it, you know, really kind of on a hands-on kind of thing, and they all wanted to kind of be a part of the, the vibe of what was going on. And so through the whole process of building structures and ideas, and, and one of the things that Rod, or two of the things that Rod really, really is is focused on that have become kind of almost mantras in my life are what would have to be true in order for the next step to be true, and what would have to be true for the next step to be true. And then constantly pumping into your head to think and dream extravagantly. Um, and it's easy to dream extravagantly and then say, hey, we have to break this down into reality. 
And his view of things is the exact opposite. Let's dream extravagantly. In fact, let's let's dream and cast a vision that's so fucking big that we can't reach it. You know, yeah. at least in our, our as we perceive things now, we just yeah. there's no way to get there. I'll tell you what, man. What's incredible is as we sat down and did that, we've literally achieved three quarters of the things that we dreamed extravagantly on, yeah. and and could not at the time have even considered. Um, so anyway. Uh, partway through that process, um, he actually came and said, you know what, let's do this together. Um, um, we didn't get some million-dollar loan or um, be granted money. My dad it didn't die. He's alive, as is my mom. There's no inheritance. Uh, we were extended a actually a, a relatively small loan uh, to get the process started. And then myself, Rod, and my, my other partner, Tony White, uh, who we'll have to talk about because that guy's freaking incredible, um, we all put in out of our personal money, equity, um, cash. And what we did was we found, looked, looked and found a facility and an owner or a landlord, if you will, um, who believed in the vision too. And, and so we literally just surrounded ourselves with like-minded people. And so we started asking questions about, Hey, what can we barter? What can we pay for? What can we do this? We're doing this grandiose thing on a budget that people would probably uh, laugh at. In fact, most of these guys in town that have studios probably have paid more for their studio than we did. Yeah, um, we're not working with a with a crap ton of money. We're working with a great big dream and a group of people that believe in that dream, and we're surrounding ourselves with people who are invested and enrolled in that dream. And and we've m- figured out a way, man you know yeah. legitimately and um just because we've enrolled people in the vision we did the demolition on this place ourselves you know we stripped these floors ourselves we painted these walls ourselves um and so it's not, it's not one of those things where you know we've had contractors for everything we've done a lot of it ourselves or at least the parts that we were allowed to you know legally do by ourselves so yeah man it's just a it's a dream that is uh, the culmination of a bunch of people sharing a vision for something beautiful. Yeah. So um, it's more than just uh, just a recording studio or just a record label. It's it's a for you. It's about building a community and, and something that goes beyond like a physical space. It's it's a group of like minded individuals helping each other succeed to get to the to their grandiose. Uh, dreams to dream extravagantly yeah you know yeah i think at least for me and maybe it's just i'm at that point in my career um i don't want to do records that i want to do anymore um but we talked about this in the last podcast um you know we were talking community 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 and sunshine james who focused an artist we just signed to third and james records um he was on the last podcast um he used the word together yeah, and and that, that that struck me, and it's actually stuck in my head this week. Um, we want to make records together, and so when you become an in-house guy at a studio, there's this dynamic, right? You're you're stoked because you're you you know I, I forget the statistic, but recently I heard that there are you know uh, ten fifteen thousand kids in audio engineering programs around the country, and they're all vying for like fifty jobs. Yeah. Um, or something along I, I those lines. I know how that is. It's incredible <laughs> yeah. how how difficult it is to. It's easy to go in and and get somebody to let you intern and do the grunt work. It's another thing to get to a point where you're actually engineering and producing. Yeah. And unlike myself, you know, a lot of these kids have. In fact, we have one sitting here right now with us who came in tonight to talk about, um, you know, second engineering here at, at Third and James. Did he get the job? Dude, he can have it if he wants it. Grant, what's your last name? Gibson. Grant Gibson. Grant Gibson got the job. Guitar Ladies Center, uh, Colorado Ave, right? Something like the yeah. Um, these guys go to school and they learn how to do this stuff, right? And then they they come in and they get into studios and they get used for three months and then they get tossed out, right? <laughs> it's similar to the way that artists are treated in studios too. Artists will go out and do all the work. Um, they'll build their followings. They'll they'll work on their music incessantly. And then they come into the studio and they're kind of met with this, how much can we get done in a certain amount of hours yeah. kind of mentality. On, on their budget. On their budget, exactly. And so 
what happens is you're assigned as an in-house guy, you're assigned to their record, whether you want to do it or not, whether you like the music or not, or whether you um, feel invested in the project or not. And what ends up happening is that, especially at the kind of the, the lower or middle levels uh, of music, you end up putting out mediocre records. And then what yeah. starts happening is mediocrity kind of becomes that that uh that playing field that everybody's on yeah so it's like hey who can get just a little bit above mediocrity yeah and so third and james um part of our vision for this thing was the exact opposite was kind of like um can we figure out how to create a culture in which we get to know the artist um by riding together and playing together and hanging together and kind of doing life together um before we start working on a record, before we start writing for the record, before we start even talking about the record. So when it comes to sitting down and, and actually starting pre-production on that record, we you're actually sitting with somebody who's um, at, at the very least a friend and hopefully bordering on family. Yeah. Um, and so that was the design of 3rd and James was can we create that culture? Can we create yeah. that creative space? Um, and so you go back to being large and all that kind of thing. Part of, part of that thing was, I mean, we're sitting in this great big freaking room right now with a 15 foot garage door, which is an absolute nightmare for sound that we're trying to figure out how to manage right now, but it's there because when we sat and dreamed as a group of people who wanted to do this, one of the dreams was they wanted a freaking garage door. So we found a space with a garage door that we can open up in the summers and freaking barbecue, you know? And so now we're trying to figure out how to manage it. So yeah. I think that, even though that's kind of a dumb example, that I think that in and of itself is kind of testament to the way the Third and James runs. We want to be a space that people feel creative in, they feel at home in, and so as artists grow and develop into these um, successful careers or not successful careers, who gives a fuck, right? As they grow and, and build, when they're out on the road and they're coming back, they're looking at Third and James and saying, "I can't wait to go home. Yeah, can't wait to go home and, and make a record." Um, and so. Yeah, yeah, we are, man. We're more than the record label. We're more than the studio. In fact, the record label, I'm sure you, we're talking about that more, but the, rec the record label was built almost out of necessity. Yeah. Um, we were making records with our friends. Yeah. And then, um, you know, we actually ended up, we're consulting with Bruce Pavitt from Sub Pop Records. And I remember in the first... Sub Pop, like Nirvana yeah. and... Yeah, we, we reached Postal out. Postal Service Sub Pop? Yeah, Sub -Pop. man. Yeah, I mean... One of the things I, I remember asking Bruce, I said, man, tell me that um, making records with my friends is a, a bad idea. Or I think more accurately, I said, tell me that spending money on my friends is a bad idea. And he said, no, man. He goes, never, ever stop making records with your friends. He goes, that's how we built Sub Pop. And that inspired me, man. And even though we were three quarters of the way through this, I think there was that nagging thing in the back of my mind of, um, you know, we're kind of building this just for our friends. Um, and I realized that every artist that comes to that door that gets involved in the community is becoming a friend. And really what third and James is, is a group of people making records with friends. Yeah. Um, and everybody's playing on everybody's record and all that kind of crap. So it's just, uh, it really is, man, it's community. And I know that's as cliche as you can possibly fucking be. Um, but we mean it here. Yeah. You know? Well, well, in a time where community and social is thrown around a lot but in reality community and socializing with people is becoming more of a, a scarce thing because of things like social media mm -hmm. where you think you're being social but you you're really just isolating yourself and and putting out a picture of what you want people to see instead of how you actually are as a human sure what what I've learned just from the year that I've known you is like this is an actual uh, real community that uh, actually cares about each other. And I don't think I've seen you turn down one person that that wants to be a part of this. And to be honest, I didn't know what it what it meant to be a part of a community because there's not really things like this in the music business. Well, no or want. Yeah. I think I think you know you you can know as an artist what it means to be a part of a community in one way or at least intellectually right I think wanting to be a part of a community is you have to be at a certain place yeah I think oftentimes young artists who are brand new um and scared 
want to be a part of a community, especially with people who have the capacity in their mind to help them get farther in their thing. Yeah. But therein lies a problem, right? Yeah. So you want to be a part of a community because that community contains people that can help you get um, bigger and better. And, you know, the goal is, you know, world domination, right? Coming down on a zip cord from the back of the fucking, you know, arena or yeah. flying over it on a tree like Taylor Swift. That's pretty <laughs> fucking cool, by the way. Yeah. I saw that the other day on YouTube. I was like, holy shit, Taylor puts on a show. She wrote a tree? What? Yeah, man. It's like, it's like she levitates on this boom. But, yeah. man, it's incredible. That girl. Anyway. But then there's the other side of it, which is. Uh, or, or let's say the center section, if you will, um, that's uh, artists who are entrepreneurs in and of themselves to a certain degree. And they will look at, and I guess, kind of perceive community to be perhaps a crutch where it's like, I need to do this all on my own. Yeah. Um, and I get that, man. Because, I, I mean, I spent a big part of my career there. And I think every artist will go through at least some level of that where they uh, they just feel like they got to go out and do it on their own. And oftentimes, when you're supporting other people's careers, which is what we really strive for here, um, if you know if if you, if one artist has a contact, um, do they have to give it to that to the other artist? No, not necessarily. Um, but it's one of those things where in a community, of people really love each other. There's definitely some of those options. It's it's incredible to watch around here things that happen for one person that end up being a benefit to the other people. And it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, everybody's giving everybody everything like we're some sort of fucking hippie commune or some yeah. shit. Um, but there's there's those folks that they just feel like they got to go do it on their own. And then there's the artists. I think really where we find our sweet spot is with the artists who have some level of, of experience in this thing. Um, and... And in one way or another, whatever their their personal experience is, they've kind of come to a conclusion that greatness comes through collaboration. And at least that's, you know, kind of the model that we have around here. Or at the very least, um, it's just more fun to do things with other people. Yeah, totally. You know? And so if you can get past kind of the, and I hate to say it because this is actually a benefit in music to a lot of artists, um, in maybe in normal social life, not so much, but a certain level of narcissism that says it has to be me, 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 me. Yeah. Um, then a place like Third and James would make sense for you because you can still be me, 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 um, but you have a bunch of people behind you going, you, 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 you. I yeah. mean, look at you, man. You're a fucking stud. You know, go out and do your thing. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, when it's their turn, you're in that parade behind them going, yeah. you, 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 you. You know, and so I think that, uh, you know, there's a sweet spot. Not everybody's going to dig our vibe. Not everybody's going to want to kind of. Well, I think to add to that, sorry to interrupt. I think it's with some artists, there's the the me, me, me thing. But there's also the me thing because uh, there's some shady people in the music business. And just me being in a band, I've met some really slimy people. And if I wasn't cautious, I could be in some really bad situations. Mm -hmm. Um like finance wise or just my music wise, which totally. if, if you don't look out for that, I mean, I feel like I hear that everywhere, you know, like look out, like look after yourself. And it's really rare that something like this comes along. That's why I know when you told me this the other day that I was the most skeptical person. Yeah. By you. far. Yeah. You and Mike Sandoval. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's just because I won't name names. There's been people in the past that, I put trust into and the music business and it just turned out to be complete bullshit. And so, you know, it's like getting your heart broken for the first time after, sure. after you have your first love, you're kind of a little more cautious of how totally. you throw your, your love around. I mean, so I'm here and I, I and truly hosting believe a podcast. Yeah. Hosting a podcast <laughs> with you. I drank the Kool-Aid everybody. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, no, you know, I, I think that there's always going to be those people out there who are trying to take advantage um, of artists. I think, you know, because there's such a desire to be, um, you know, uh, big and, and famous and everything. You know, everybody yeah. wants shortcuts. They want to find a way to, um, you know, get there faster, uh, so on and so forth, you know. So, yeah. I mean, whether it's, you know, a manager or a booking agent coming and saying that they'll manage or book you for you know, a small upfront fee or, or some kind of retainer, you know, or something like that. Or like, um, Hey, there's an A&R showcase. Yeah. Like, yeah, you don't have to pay us up anything up front, but, uh, you know, here's 50 presale tickets that you, that you have to sell. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think in a town like Denver that has a lack of like formal industry, if you will, 
um, it's very easy for a vacuum to be created that attracts a bunch of people who, who are, you know, come to town and are trying to, in one way or another, you know, scam their way into um, working with artists. And um, there's really nobody to call them on their bullshit. Um, and so it's just kind of trial and error and artists find themselves having to, um, you know, kind of learn um, with anything new. Like, you know, I mean, we, we know that, that, that people look at us too and wonder what the heck we're about and, and what we're doing. And, and, um, you know, as I sit with artists, it's, it's funny, you know, we start to see, um, that skepticism kind of, uh, kind of, um, fade away, yeah. um, as they get to know us and kind of get to ha hang around and are, you know, in the community of music. I think what happens is it's from, from the artist up to the studio, um, labels, production, you name it. I think everybody's watching out for that kind of thing. You know, um, we're, we're watching out for that kind of thing constantly you know as a label we have you know people all of the time coming and trying to sell us on their distribution or mixing and mastering or somehow they're going to be able to take us to one level or another that supposedly we couldn't get to on our own um you know that sort of thing we're, we're all dealing with it yeah but in a town that doesn't have um kind of this standard this industry standard that people can kind of look to and say okay well i know that's real um but I don't know about this, you know, this, this doesn't look so real. Uh, what happens is we kind of all get compartmentalized into these little spaces where we feel safe. Right. And we, you know, we, we have a tendency to not want to work, um, with, with just anyone, um, or work with new people and so on. And so, um, you know, one of the things that's been frustrating for us in that regard is that, um, you know, in some of these other towns, you know, our experience has been that, um, you know, if, if like, take, for example, this microphone I'm talking on right now goes out, um, you know, you can call up the studio down the street and say, hey, man, can I borrow your your, your Neumann? You know, I'm doing a, a vocal session. And they'll be like, yeah, man, we'll send our runner down and uh, and boom, you're back to work again. Um, I, I haven't found that here. And I don't think that's Denver's fault. I think that's just a matter of um, the trust factor not being there, because, like I said, there's there's no standard. And so. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's an interesting dynamic. Well, I'll, I'll say it. Okay, when when say I it, first you met you and you told me the idea of Theron James, cause it, it was, it was just, uh, and I really wanted it to be true. I just didn't know if I could buy in. Yeah. That's how anything at first is mm -hmm. like people have to, totally. to test the water and, and see if it's real or not. And especially in Denver, you know, like I didn't even know until you kind of explained to me that that's how other studios worked in different states yeah. uh, or in, in industry towns where it wasn't yeah. a doggy dog type of, no, it was my studio and yeah. you can go F yourself if you think I'm going to help you. Help you. Yeah. Like just send your clients my way and that's yeah. how I'll help you. Yeah. No, man. I mean, and the thing is, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. In any industry town, everybody has an agenda. It's yeah. the music industry. Everybody is in the gym. Yeah. So I loan you my mic. Yeah. I mean, next week, you know, I want two from you. Yeah. But but there's a, there's a there's almost like this like how would you say almost this imaginary Switzerland when it comes down to actually making music. There's this little space where everybody functions. Yeah. You know, and so granted, everybody's trying to get that big budget project. Everybody's trying to you know be the spot where you know some big name does their their next you know, number one hit. So especially like in Nashville, you drive through Nashville and they've got these banners hanging out in the front of the, of, of the fucking studios and everything saying, Hey, the last place where the number one hit for Blake Shelton was recorded. I mean, everybody's got their thing and everybody's, you know, um, publicizing and, and trying to, trying to be, you know, but yeah, man, there's this space where it comes down to the nitty gritty doing the work. Yeah. Um, where the guys work with each other and it's friendly competition. It's friendly as competition can be in a business context, but, um, and I'm not trying to put Denver down in any way. It just, when I got here and was kind of looking at it, it felt um, very compartmentalized and like this is my space and I have to kind of stay in my space um, and do records by myself because I'm not going to get that, um, you know, team kind of thing yeah. in this town. And so when we did kind of separate and come out on our own, like we talked about earlier, that was the picture of Third and James was we will be the place um, that will help. And so, like we've talked about with you, you know, by the way, people, Sean is producing now, um, officially, right? Officially. He's hung producing. out a shingle, Young Odyssey. <laughs> officially, yeah. yeah. He's working out of 3rd and James, which is just freaking awesome. Um, 
we want to be incubating brands. And so instead of being a studio that that tells you all the reasons you're going to fail if you decide to leave um, or a label or, or whatever that's telling you why you're going to leave um, and fail, we want to be a place that says, do what can we do to be involved in you getting better? Yeah. Um, if we could be a part of that conversation in 20 years, yeah, the story of community and the story of bringing people together to make music, yeah. to create something bigger than ourselves, then yeah, man, I'm fucking stoked. Yeah, I think that's, that's the only way. I mean, I was I was really blown away when I presented you the idea of hey, can I can I brand myself out of your studio? Because mm-hmm. most people would be like, hell no. Like this yeah, is right. my studio. Like this yeah. is my thing, and I I really respect that because it, it shows more than than you know that it's it's not about you. It's about what's happening in the community. Sure, and and that de- like I, I may it may seem on my part that like I I don't want to be a part of the community. I definitely do want to be a part of the community. Um, but it also I really appreciate that you're letting me. Uh, like figure out my stuff inside this sure incubating it or whatever and that goes a lot further than than other places where hey fuck you if you're not in-house um yeah it just it's it's it just shows it's a real thing that you actually do care about what's going on and not not a like you you do have your own agenda always and and everybody does but it's 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 cool that that when you do talk about your agenda, you talk about your agenda. It's not this yeah. make yeah. believe thing. You you just straight up say like, you know, this is what I'm getting from it, and this is what you're getting yeah. from it. So I mean, honestly, you know, in my 40s now, to honestly, like, there's a, a certain level of legacy building in that I want to be a part of a story, you know. And I think you know one of the things that was attractive about Denver when we got here and <coughs> When we got here and kind of like, uh, you know, started assessing what was going on, it felt like there was a lot of white space. So there was space for that in town. And so, yeah, there's some legacy building going on. I want to be a part of a conversation. And whether, you know, somebody does a documentary about the Denver, you know, music scene in 25 years, like they did about Muscle Shoals or Nashville or any of those places. um, You know, if I could be a little blip in that documentary... Um, as a place that came in and said, hey, let's, you know, let's build something, let's do something together. I would be happy with that. But the way I see it, if if we've got killer producers, um, engineers, artists, but let's, you know, focus on the producer engineer thing here. If we've got killer producers who are um, building brands, um, you know, man, it just, it creates this network of of excellence um, and if, if we can be here and be a teaching facility uh, for guys that, that aren't quite there, I'm not saying that we know everything, obviously, but, you know, we can coach and say kind of this is how we do things, and that takes uh, kind of takes them to a new level. Killer. Or guys like you that are already good at what you do. I mean, if we can be a place that allows you to build yourself into, um, you know, something much, much bigger, there's a kickback on that in just just reputation. There's a kickback there in regards to relationship, and there's a kickback there in friendship. And so for me, I look at it and go, if if Sean Grant, you know, goes out and produces, you know, eight Grammy award-winning records, how does the story of Sean Grant and Young Odyssey happen without the name Third and James somewhere in that story? Yeah. You know, and, and not Josh's name, but Third and James and artists and and engineers and and people working in the in in the way background um all of those people can 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 watch that or look at that with a sense of pride and and say man i was a part of that movement and and i think that's uh you know ultimately where i see the benefit being i get where studios are coming from yeah you know obviously if if you've got some guy that's in your studio that's working his own brand and taking stuff to other studios and and doing all that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah, there's a bottom line financially that can be difficult. I guess I just look at the long game and say it's going to be much, much, much more beneficial for us. Um, I mean, fuck beneficial. Much more rewarding for us to, yeah. to have those 
relationship. So yeah, man, that's we're incubating, and I mean that's a weird word. I bet it's the right word. Is it? Yeah. I just feel yeah. I mean I don't want it to be a demeaning word in any way, shape, or form, but giving guys a spot to do their music and do it well. Yeah. You know? I mean hell, I'm doing the same thing, man. I'm a producer. I don't produce under Third and James. I produce under my name. Yeah. Um, Third and James, in large part, is incubating my fucking brand. Yeah. You know. So it's like it's it's. I would love to one day be able to have this just scheme of of producers, you know, logos on our website of, yeah. you know, who who works here, who has worked here, and continues to work here. You know, I, that to me is just exciting. Yeah. So. Well, since we're kind of on the topic, so you're obviously a music producer. Let's go. Let's go into that. Like, what's your What's your philosophy on producing? What, what? Let's start with like what kind of music you produce, or do you produce a kind of music, or are you like Rick Rubin? Like, what kind of producer well, are dude, you? Dude, that's rough. I'm like Rick Rubin, people. <laughs> Rick Rubin. When, when I when I say that, I mean like, just, are you genreless? Like, can you cross genres? God, I mean, I hope so. Um, you know, I'm I came up in. Um, obviously the, the kind of the country thing um not not so much um i guess to say you know coming up playing um like i, I said earlier my i think i said my, my dad's a pastor yeah um, I said that. and so they had a thrift store that was attached to the church um business-wise and i used to go in there and steal eight tracks and because i we had this old eight track player in the garage and um you know and tapes um, cassette tapes and I would listen to you know Rose Royce and Rick James and and Quincy man and Lionel Richie and shit for some reason that stuff the J early Jacksons as a bass player that shit just like spoke to me and so I'm like a white guy who you know can play some funk bass which is <laughs> you got the funk I I don't know if I have the funk you got the funk I have a funk <laughs> or some level of funk um but so I fell in love with the groove, right? And so coming up, I don't know how, but like I said earlier, working with really, really good producers really early in my career because things happened for us, um, I began to develop this like understanding of the hook and song um, writing and song development. And, and so for me, it's become more about whether it's country music or anything else. Um, about the hook and about the song as a whole and and so i've been kind of falling into um country music americana roots kind of vibe um simply because i love that shit yeah and um i've i've landed there producing wise in large part but what people don't know is that i've done um i've done funk records i've done rock records and straight up pop records of um, you know, work with cello and violinists, you know, things along those lines. Um, I guess I look at it like this. If I have an artist come in, no matter what their genre is, and I listen to what they do, um, I want to be able to be self-aware enough to say, I'm not the guy to do your record. Yeah. Or, or I think I could, I think I could kill this. You know? Yeah. And then it comes up to the artist as to whether or not the vibe's right, producer-wise. Um, but... I would say this, and I think I've said this to you and just about everybody else that's walked in this room, and you have to picture this example against a pane of glass. Um, in the church office, my dad's church office, they had a copy machine, and we used to copy everything all the way down to our, our dicks. Like We would <laughs> stick our asses on there, our faces on there, our hands on there. You, you, you were copy. young, right? <laughs> yeah. Last year, no, we were dad's uh, office. This two months we ago. Copying our asses. Yeah. Um, I think there's kind of three kinds of producers, in in my opinion. Um, there's a thumbprint producer, kind of a snout print. You know, you do a blow first on a window, and then there's kind of an ass print, and you have to picture somebody sticking their ass against the glass, and I apologize for that mental image. Um, but an ass print producer is kind of like one of those producers where you can listen to a record that they've done, and I won't name names because that's, you know, fucked up. But there are several producers out there that I can listen to a record and go, holy shit, Homeboy did that record. Yeah. And nine, well, maybe not nine times, but seven times out of ten, I'm right. right? Yeah. 
They put their stamp on it. But not just a stamp. Like they like stand up and piss on it just because they're like they're like I I own this. Yeah, and mark their territory. And then you've got producers that kind of fall into that middle category where you hear things, certain dynamics, the way they mic things, the way they run the board, um, and you can say, "Well, I wonder if Homeboy did this record because you can hear little things." And then the thumbprint producer is a guy like Rick Rubin, who who you can listen to it and go who the fuck did that record? There's just something incredible about the record. So, you know, you listen to Rick Rubin and, and you go down the, the massive list of people he's done. And, and, and then he does Johnny Cash in his living room yeah. for the American recordings. Right. And, and you, and when I heard Rick Rubin did that, I was like, that was like the end all be all for me of, I want to be like that in the way that I approach producing. Yeah. So I you think don't, you don't leave your ass print. No, no ass print. Yeah. No greasy Velcro <laughs> on the window. Um, I think the one thing that I love about him is that um, you know there's you know I mean you can read stuff I've never obviously never you know met or worked with Rick Rubin in any way shape or form but um, you know he talks about he's not like an in the room everyday kind of producer he just he has this ability to come in listen to what's been done and go like that hook just doesn't work you know, type of thing. He's got an ear. And so for me, I am in, in, in the room producer. In fact, I'm in, in the tracking room producer where, um, why I generally will work with an engineer on the board is because I want to be in the room, um, sitting down and actually, um, a part of the process of being, you know, of the music being created with the band in the tracking room. Um, and I like to think that if the, if the song's right, if the hook's right, if the players are right, you know, and then maybe I can do things right. So, yeah, definitely I get funneled into country Americana quite a bit. Um, I would hope that as my career develops, especially, I would get um, become known for just doing good records instead yeah. of a good country record, if that makes sense. I mean, everybody's got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> um, when does that start? <laughs> All right, so what's, how does the, the studio side of things work? Once the studio opens, which... When when is the studio? When does it open? Well, you're jinxing us because <laughs> we're we said we're opening next month for about six months. Yeah. Um, as of now, the drop dead date is January seventh because I have a record book January seventh, and then we start. We've got all the way. You know, we're booking well into next year already. Uh, as far as how the studio works, like I said earlier. We're not a studio in that um, we're a record label with a studio. Um, not just a studio. We're bringing in vinyl manufacturing. Um, we're actually working with now a manufacturing company that does, you know, screen printing and, and basically merchandise uh, manufacturing um, to try and bring it all in-house. So we'll have, um, you know, merchandise, vinyl. So we've got a couple of lathes, a couple a couple presses. Um, we're working on the plating aspect of the vinyl thing. Um, so we're, we're a record label that has a studio, that has manufacturing, that has vinyl. Um, but we don't want to be closed because then all of a sudden we become some sort of fucking weird-ass cult or click or some yeah. shit, right? Um, so basically how the studio works is this. Um, anybody is welcome to call us up and come in and sit down about their project. And we have a group of guys, including Sean sitting here, folks, uh, but a group of guys who, who are working out of the studio in addition to myself, um, who, if they, like, love your shit, then, then yeah, we'll do your record, you know. Um, but we're not going to be available for the, the guy calling up and saying, hey, can I just get two hours, unless we have somebody that wants to do those two hours. Yeah. So it kind of comes down to, you know, is there somebody here – that's uh that that's willing to kind of take on what you do and i guess the dynamic is this we want to make records that that we're passionate about and we feel like if if we're not the right people to make your record then there's probably somebody around uh, studio wise yeah. who will make your record and do it better yeah um than than we would because they'd be invested in your project so we want to say every time we turn on that console we're turning it on because it's a record we want to do yeah so everybody feel welcome to come in and sit down and talk with us and we've got guys that do everything for every level 
all the way the spectrum so don't be afraid to ask and come in and, and set up a meeting and sit down with us and and the bottom line is we're softies like if if we fall in love with you as a person chances are we're probably going to figure out a way to make your record yeah so that that's kind of how we work okay what do we got all right so so that's how the the studio side works how how is the the label going to work is it yeah how's how's the label side of of third and james work well we talked about this earlier but the label was kind of happened by accident and necessity in that we were making records for people that we loved and then they were going out and trying to um you know put that record you know put you know put the record out into the market and not having success and and you know we started looking i think well let me go back the first question we were asking is what why, why what's the problem why why are things not working and um and we're all functioning within the context of the record labels broken yeah um so we all know that the 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 major labels are predominantly working off of uh manufactured artists you know artists yeah. that they're that picking they can, and choosing yeah that they can basically write all the songs for and sure dump some money in and then make their money sure. back or they're they're fishing out of the pond of artists that have are incredibly marketable that have publishing deals, um, and they're able to kind of capitalize on on their publishing deal. And you know, I mean, labels just don't have a whole lot of area to make money anymore. Well, and the and the three sixty deal now, where it's they take. Yeah. And I'm not. I mean, I'll be straight. Like three sixty deals, or like even third and James contracts. This level is some level of three sixty. Um, it's it's hard to work these days without you know 360 in one way or another with with streaming and well oh absolutely and yeah people I, not buying music yeah I mean I heard a statistic that stati- st- that's one of those words statistic statistic um, recently that that man I, I don't even want to put the percentage out there, but some huge percentage of artists in 2018 aren't even going to produce any level of of cd or anything because it's you know it's all streaming digital downloads are now almost irrelevant here's the thing that people have to remember is that uh, major labels have entire digital departments that are that are literally dedicated to manipulating streaming and manipulating um you know where their artist lands and and if you're dumb enough to think that they don't have some level of of agreements going on that, that takes one artist to this level or this level, or this level, then you're you're fucking. You mean retarded. like on Spotify and yeah, all over. And it, but here's the thing too, the and I think I heard this on your podcast actually. I mean, uh, talking to you guys as management company, uh, um, Jason, Jason Jason Martin, Jason Martin. Um, what was it? They had some artist that was at like three hundred thousand or three hundred three hundred million streams, I think and so, yeah. and and radio still wouldn't pay attention to him. I mean, you're talking about an overwhelming, overwhelming hurdle for an independent artist to get over, which is, number one, building a, a, a truly organic following that's unpurchased on, 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 in, on social media. And, and so many bands go out and they purchase followers and they purchase likes. What they don't realize is that we all have the software to see if they've purchased likes or purchased followers. Um, they're battling against um, club owners and promoters and everything that want them to pre-sell tickets and all this kind of stuff. And so it comes down to where a band really only has their live show and their merchandise to make any money on. And the thing is that that trickles down to the label as well, um, where the label can make money, which is why the 360 is, is such a predominant thing in the industry right now. Um, so reality is, um, you know, the major label, the big four, you know, right? And I, I don't know if I've, I've got these right. Universal, Warner, Sony. Yeah. So one of the who's the fourth? No. No. Disney? No. Anyway, you've got so you got the big four, and they maybe are maybe three now. Maybe. Who knows? Um, yeah, man. I mean, we get to the point where we don't even fucking know who's what. Maybe it's Disney <laughs> now, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's Costco. It's Costco. <laughs> Costco Records. Kirkland Records. Kirkland Records. <laughs> Sunshine James has joined us, folks. If you can hear his ugly ass in the background, <laughs> the point being that the major the major label has 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 dominated the market, and so what's happening is is that in what I'm seeing is that the independent labels popping back up because there's still a need for artists to find tour support. 
Um, there's still a need for, for artists to um, have, you know, merchandise help and things along those lines. Videos. So, what's that? Videos. Videos. Things so that so people forth. expect now as exactly. you're an artist. But they're not facing a $150,000 recoup. Yeah. Right? And so that's that's where Third and James kind of stepped into the equation was kind of like saying, can we find a way to help artists be able to succeed uh, without having to have some massive recoup amount, which is why we are bringing in manufacturing, why we built the studio. Um, we're currently in the middle of, of negotiating our distribution for vinyl, um, you know, which which is the only you know physical medium that's still selling. Um, and to be able to manufacture merchandise in-house. So instead of an artist starting to recoup their merchandise costs off of the markup from the manufacturer to the wholesale price that they're selling it to the label, and then from the label marking up again for the artist, we're basically starting from zero. We're starting at cost. Um, you know, So for us, the label was, was, like I said, out of necessity, one of those things where we're looking at it and saying, what can we do cheaper for the artist? And so, anyway, needless to say, we're sitting in a spot now where, um, like I said, we're in the vinyl distribution deal. We're yeah. in the middle of a big publishing deal that we're working on for our artists because the bottom line is if you don't have a publishing deal, you don't exist um, at this point. Um, we're coming back and saying our primary focus is tour support. Um, you know, what can we do to, to get you into larger places with more people? And then lastly, really media you know, both social media and, you know, standard media. So we're in the process now of, of, of working working with a company that we're um, negotiating with at the moment on, on that. So the goal is can we develop an artist to such a degree that we can present them to major representation and have yeah. them be successful? So you guys are an artist-friendly label. Is that safe to say? We're trying to be. Yeah. Trying to be. I mean, you got to keep the lights on. Yeah. But I think there's a couple of things that we're focused on with our contracts. Number one, uh, we want artists to be making money before they recoup. Um, so if you're asking an artist to, um, nowadays, you know, unless you're signed to one of the big four, you know, some big advance is kind of pie in the sky, right? Um, you know, hey, here's a million dollar advance. You get to live on this for the next year while we work on your shit. Yeah. Um, that's just not, not on the independent level, not an option. And so for us, what we're saying is, um, we're going to allow you to make money while you're recouping. So if you're out playing your live show, uh, you're making that money. When you're selling merchandise, you're making that money. You're publishing, you're making that money. Sync licensing, you're making that money. And a portion of that is going to recouping, but the vast majority of that is going to the artist. So, so you're you're kind of helping incubate artists where instead of just giving them a lump of money, you're you're kind of developing them like labels – did back in the day you used where, to do. Yeah, yeah where you put time yeah. into them and, and you kind of yeah. water them and help them grow yeah i mean basically the, the idea is this you find them you develop them you produce a record and then you give them every opportunity to succeed yeah and if we can do that by bringing having this big old studio that that can cost them half the price or even more than half the price to do their record we can do their manufacturing in-house. We can put their vinyl in-house. We can get rid of the third-party aggregate and d distribute directly to iTunes and Spotify and Google and so on and so forth. Anything that we can do to help the artist be successful, um, that's where we land. That's the goal. Um, I like to, to save this, this question for towards the end. Um, what is some advice uh, you would give a young since you're a producer musician what would you give a young producer or musician becoming a producer what advice would you give them hashtag the best plug-in is plugging in the right microphone yeah number one <laughs> i think that's turned into a cliche around here right the, uh, yeah i where do plug in the right microphone yeah Take your time. Um, make records with people who you've taken the time to get to know. Yeah. If you know the artist, uh, you're going to make a better record. Okay. Um, from the standpoint of, like, a young guy coming in, be teachable. Yeah. Just learn. Um, if the words, I know, come out of your mouth, you fucked up. <laughs> um, just sh shut up. Ask questions. 
um, get to know the artist you're working with, learn how to mic correctly. And, um, and yeah, man. Is there ever a right time to become a producer? Like, will you, will you know, or does it, you just like, you know, man, that's a great fall, question. Fall into it. You just wake that's, up one that's, day that's and you're, a, great you're a producer. I think when your passion for making music supersedes your desire to perform music, maybe that's the spot. Okay. And if you're going to do it, don't over promise and under deliver. Yeah. Be straight with what your, your level is. Surround yourself with people who are better than you are that can help you make that record to the best level possible. And, um, and then fuck man, like my old football coach used to say, he'd say, if you don't know who to block, just fire out and hit somebody. And that's become a mantra in my life. So if you're getting there, just fucking fire out and hit someone. Is there anything else you want to say? Dude, I need a drink. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for sitting down with me, Josh. My pleasure. We'll see you guys next time.